you know, shall we, shall we start? I'm sure people will pick up with a couple of minutes where, where we're just doing the, the introduction. Um, what I'll do now is if I can ask the other panelists to just switch off your videos um, and then we'll, you, you can switch them on again when we, when we start with your, your sections. Thank you. Oh. You know, so okay, you thanks. keep your video on because, sir, you the, you, you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to welcome you to our webinar for this morning. Just a, a quick, quick run through the agenda. Um, the, the topics were quite well set out, I believe, in the introduction. But here's yeah, just a reminder, we'll have a welcome and introduction from the IRFA president, Enos Ngachane. Then we'll have the, the three speakers that we've invited, coins three and two, three and four, and then Enos will close for us again. And just an important reminder, um, these presentations are for information purposes and they're, they're discussion. They're not advice. We're not providing any advice. We're not allowed to provide any advice. Um, our good legal friends and compliance friends that advised me to just remind everyone on this one. Um, but hopefully the, the, the information is, is, is of value to everyone. Um, and I now want to hand over to to Enos to, to start the proceedings. Thank you, Enos. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, good morning to all our participants and including the panel that we have today. You are all welcomed. Um, I just want to start by saying that uh, crafting an investment policy statement for a retirement fund is quite a complex task. In recent times, this has been complicated by increased regulatory demands, as well as the pandemic that is confronting us and the rest of the world. In this session, we have invited subject matter specialists to provide some insights <clears throat> into aspects of this process that we are going to discuss today. We we'll start, of course, with the pandemic and ask whether any specific action needs to be taken immediately. We then look at what good advice should look like. We will end our discussion this morning with how sustainable investment practices can be incorporated into the ultimate strategy, how sustainable investment practices can be incorporated into the ultimate strategy. Thank you very much to all the participants. <coughs> Thank you, Inos. Our next speaker is Razia Ghani. Um, the, Razia's credentials are, are on screen. Um, a professional, someone who has extensive experience in the investment consulting environment. Um, Raji, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to, to, to that introduction. If not, we can move on to the, to the next slide. Um, I'm happy to just move straight on, Wayne. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Uh, and good morning, everybody. Um, and uh, thank you very much to um, both Wayne and Enos for that uh, introduction. I'm actually going to stop my video uh, just in case we have any bandwidth issues um, and hopefully no mind that. And it should also, if we're lucky, improve any sound problems. Um, I'm going to do that now. Um, so just in terms of, uh, you know, what, what where we find ourselves right now, um, we've been speaking for a very long time about low to negative return environments due to excessive debt levels, et cetera, et cetera. The coronavirus has essentially come along and been a catalyst for the recession that South Africa has technically been in a number of times over the last few years and that the global economy has been threatening for for ages. So we would have heard a lot of speakers talking about US yield curves inverting and how this is always uh, you know, see the recession. So the recession was very likely expected. The timing was not expected. 
you know, the timing was uncertain and COVID-19 basically just threw a very major spanner in the work. So it's an absolutely unprecedented event, which very few people alive today have seen the likes of in the past. Uh, unprecedented, of course, being one of the most used words these days, along with coronavirus over the last five or so months. Um, so, I mean, with, without a doubt, no portfolio was prepared for this. You know, perhaps money markets could claim that, but I mean, that's by their design, not because they knew anything was happening. So I think given the uncertainty, which still looms, and especially while there's no vaccine, any kind of modeling done at this point needs to factor in even larger potential margins of error than usually expected, just because of the sheer amount of uncertainty that we see. Thinking about strategy, I mean, we would not advocate large scale major change of uncertain market conditions. So, you know, for accumulation funds of pension funds, the old adage was these are very long-term funds. Extremely attractive during this market downturn. It is not the asset class that can provide the type of CPI growth that pension funds are generally targeting um, and that the accumulation funds need in order to reach adequate retirement levels for members. So if even if we think about low interest rate environment that we find that we find ourselves in at the minute, I mean, you know, money markets may give you a return, but at a point you may not even get real returns out of your money market fund. Um, for DB funds or funds who have LDI strategies, this type of market term will, would have proven how well matched those liability driven strategies were and whether they did what they said they were going to on the turn. So by, you know, maintaining or potentially even improving funding levels. Um, so, you know, that's from the DB perspective. I mean, most of the funds that we deal with in our market are DC funds at this point. I think if we look forward, what we're going to be um, speaking to pension funds about and asking, specifically um, boards that we're dealing with, the question is what is the type of contribution and impact that you'd like to make as a fund to the recovery of our country? So pension funds are a large industry in South Africa. Asset owners here are far more powerful than I think they realize. This is a trillions of rands worth of um, assets industry, right? Without the, these assets, um, you know, the asset management value chain may maybe a, a lot less lucrative. Um, so, I mean, the reason we're asking this question is based on the theory that most South Africans who generally retire locally, right? So if you're going to retire locally, why not contribute locally? All you're retiring into will be a good one. So where there are viable infrastructure options, for example, and other type of investments that can be attractive I think these must start being considered a lot more, you know, depending, of course, on the pension fund objectives as well, and that the investments meet those objectives. So, I mean, these could lead to very necessary investment for the country while creating jobs and contributing to the economy at the same time as also meeting your pension fund objectives. Um, and then I'll just add the, uh, you know, without the need necessarily for prescription, because of course, if the assets are viable, um, prescription won't necessarily be required. Uh, so I think we, we, need to, we need to balance the pension fund um, liquidity requirements, the regulatory requirements, and any other factors uh, that have to be considered before making investments into these areas. Uh, you know, it may be that regulatory changes may be required to actually um, allow more investment into these uh, these particular industries. Uh, private equity is limited to 10%. Very few um, pension funds actually have 10% in private equities per se, but some of the bigger funds may be, uh, you know, close to that limit. Um, you know, a lot of these projects might be very large and actually too big for pension funds to access. And last year, there was actually mention made uh, at the IRF uh, uh, conference uh, for pension funds, 
um, to actually collaborate in terms of those types of projects in order to be able to access it. Uh, so this could be a possibility. Basically, what we're saying is we need to rethink asset allocation from one that's just maximizing return at the level of risk to a model that's optimizing risk return as well as impact. Um, so currently, there's a fairly large project that um, Alexander Forbes is undergoing with a large state-owned asset manager. Uh, where they're actually doing exceptionally good work on impact efficient portfolios. So um, they, the asset manager has been doing this for the last five years, um, working on mapping out exposures of listed and unlisted investments to South Africa's economic development needs and the 17 sustainable development principles. So um, a lot of the investments required for development may not be in the listed space, so hence private markets may become a lot more important. I think for, from a trustee's perspective, it's key that they think about the type of due diligences that are required for these things. Due must be given to every aspect of the investment from an investment perspective, from an operational perspective. I mean, they're not listed instruments, so you don't have as much publicly available information. Um, so, you know, it may require the need for specialist um, you know, investment yeah. professionals in this area. Um, in terms of specific risk modeling, we actually have not made changes to our modeling per se. Um, I think a lot of these models have a lot of assumptions in them. I'm not sure that all of the risks are already um, have already played out. And so I think you know, it may be premature to be making too many changes at this point. Um, so I think what we do believe is there may be a need to consider how asset classes are considered. I mean, when we're looking at these models, of course, we always need to be considering, you know, a, um, um, a, a manual overlay. You know, we're not taking the model. There is always going to be a, a, an amount of model risk. So we're not taking the uh, asset allocation directly from the model and applying it. We have to apply some common sense as well. Um, and so I think, um, you know, from that perspective, you know, we need to look at how different asset classes might have been affected or different sectors over this period. So for example, listed property um, is, an, you know, considered an equity, uh, but always been considered as as uh, was seen as a sector that provides you with some capital growth and some income. And while this was the case, uh, and, and maybe going forward, the, the pandemic has had a particularly negative impact on this portion of the equity market due to the uncertainties, uncertainties faced by landlords not being able to collect rents, et cetera. And you know, there's a lot of negative sentiment around it and saw the sector losing over 48% over the quarter to March. So if we see a new world order where the world moves to a more online scenario in terms of shopping and where companies start moving to a more remote working environment, then a lot of these properties may actually become white elephants. Yeah? So these are the types of considerations that must be incorporated in the thinking when decisions are made. Um, we trustees and especially members are uncomfortable with the sheer level of negative returns that was experienced over this period. So in other words, the drawdowns were of such a nature that they were literally causing sleepless nights. Then those portfolios um, should be reviewed. Um, and I, I think, you know, what, what, you, what may come out of that is actually that perhaps it's more a level of, uh, of education that's required. So although our accumulation portfolios have very long time horizons, we have to remember that everybody's tolerance for risk and the ability for risk are not always necessarily aligned, right? So we need to, you know, where there were concerns, we need to go through them, make sure we understand where the risks have been taken. Um, so I think, I mean, I think it's, it's fair to say that we continue to gauge the, the long-term impact of the coronavirus and what it may have on markets going forward. 
I mean, there have been many forecasts of what the shape of the recovery could look like. And these are ranging from almost every letter of the alphabet up to in U, Bs, Ws, Ls. And then I also heard of a square root shape recently, um, which is a sharp recovery followed by a plateau. Uh, so I think, again, it's just another testament to the sheer amount of uncertainty that we're seeing in these markets. Um, if I think about the investment policy statement in particular, as per Rep 28, the IPS is generally updated on an annual basis or when any significant changes are made to strategy or regulation. Uh, if there are no explicit changes, um, then there are no, you know, if no changes are made to strategy, then there would be no need for changes right now. But I mean, where pension funds are reconsidering their policy specifically in the ESG, RI, and impact investing space, uh, which most funds are doing in one way or another these days, these are the policies that will need to be updated to reflect the, uh, the, the fund's current views. Um, yeah, so I think, meaning, you know, in conclusion, trustees need to be comfortable with the strategies that have been built to benefit from through the cycle returns especially for accumulation portfolios, which have longer time horizons for members. Um, again, as we said, where there was discomfort with drawdowns, it needs to be reviewed. Uh, there must be a clear understanding of the levels of risk that were taken. If more education is required, then that's what needs to be done. Um, I think where last stage models are being used, pre-retirement portfolios must also be considered in the shorter time frame, because, you know, the all asset classes had negative returns over some months. So there were very little places to, to hide. Um, so I think, um, you know, members had some amount of temporary relief uh, from the downturn in that they are able to, uh, so when I say I'm talking about specifically members who are about to retire, so they have the means to actually um, remain in the fund a bit longer you know, so regulations were changed a couple of years ago that allowed that, so that members are able to actually, you know, wait it out until there's a recovery. So this may not always be possible, but if members do have the means to delay those withdrawals, that's also something that um, that can be considered, uh, especially if the uh, yeah. So I mean, depending on how long that that permission takes to play out. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think that's really everything from my side. I think, um, I mean, I recently listened to a New Zealand speaker and we know that they've had, you know, really good um, outcome from this pandemic. And, uh, and one of the things he was saying was he, he actually believes that personal recovery will actually be quite quick. You know, once lockdowns are lifted, people go back to normal and carry on you know, as, as before, but the macroeconomic recovery will probably take quite a long time. Um, so, yeah, I think, um, I mean, the, <clears throat> the other positive that may come out of this is that we may actually see more, um, more of a savings culture, especially in South Africa, where we ha have historically not had a very good savings culture. Um, I don't know if it necessarily will change, but the fact is once you know, people go through something like this, they do tend to remember those habits and, uh, you know, try to um, compensate for it in the future. So that we may actually see a lot more um, youngsters, you know, once we've managed to sort out all our other problems, um, actually having a better savings culture in anticipation of another, you know, pandemic of some sort that, that could happen unexpectedly. Um, so, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that uh, and see if there's any, uh, any comments or questions. Thank you, Razia. No one? Ah, look, there, there's one. Um, there, there's one question before we move on to, to the panel. Um, do you foresee a punch for later retirement dates resulting from the pandemic? It's probably a Delaying, um, delaying yeah. I would assume, yes. Yes. Uh, so, so I'm, I, I'm assuming you're saying later retirement dates, in other words, changing the retirement age. 
Probably, I think that's... Um, I mean, I think this is something that a lot of funds have been doing um, and have been talking about. A lot of that because of, you know, the lower, lower returns that we've been seeing and, and realizing that actually, you know, people may actually need to work a bit longer just to get a, a decent retirement pot. So, I mean, yeah, I think not necessarily just because of the pandemic, but I think it, it could be something that people would be, would be thinking about. Um, you know, if I look at a lot of the funds we deal with, a lot of them have actually in recent times already um, changed the, um, changed the, the retirement, um, retirement ages. Yeah, prescribed assets. Um, uh, <laughs> John, um, <laughs> so yes. Um, look, I, prescribed assets is something that's been spoken about uh, for the last couple of years. Um, nothing has ever actually come out of it. We have no, there's no view on what kind of assets would be prescribed, how it would be prescribed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, as we, as I, I kind of mentioned, I mean, look, if the assets that the government would like to prescribe are viable assets for pension funds that actually meet the CPI plus objectives, then I don't know if there's a need for prescription, right? Also, I think the other factor that we need to take into account is, you know, as a country, we probably, we actually do need a lot of outside investment, right? As an emerging market, that is actually where we get a lot of our investment is from, you know, sovereign wealth funds, etc. looking for yield, foreign investors looking for yield, they're coming to our market because we have a lot better interest rates, etc. And those guys really look uh, negatively at prescription, you know, because as soon as you have that, you, you know, things are just not priced uh, correctly because everything is prescribed, you know, so it's not really the kind of free market that they're used to. Um, so, Look, we don't know. Pre prescription has been thrown around for, for a long time now. And look, it, it might be more necessary now. But I think the fact is the trustees have a duty to, um, you know, they are targeting the pension fund objectives for members. They have to do what's best for members. They cannot, um, you know, invest in opportunities that are not going to be able to meet those members objectives. So I think that's quite important. Um, See, there, 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 are more, there are more questions related to prescribed assets. I, I, I don't want to dismiss them yes. at the moment, but I think this is a, a topic all on its own. Really, that that's true, that yeah. needs to be, be explored. So I'm, what I'm suggesting is maybe we, we take this one offline and, and see how we can collaborate with CFA and other, other organizations yes. possibly to, to, yes. to find some, some meaningful answer for, 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 for these questions. Yep, I think, I think that's fine. Okay. I hope you don't mind us. Uh, Sorry, Kevin. No. As well. Um, Can we, yeah, maybe move on just for, for the sake of time so that we, yeah. is there, Thing. So, so what I would like to do as well, and, and thank you for the questions that have been raised, and if we haven't answered them now, we'll, we'll definitely get to, to answer them at, at, a, at, a, later, at a later point. Um, I, I would like to invite the, the, the other speakers and, and uh, the IRFA president to, to, to engage a little with this question, if there is anything they want to add um, to what Razia has said. <clears throat> And if there's nothing, it's also all right. Uh. <laughs> well, Gandhi and Wayne. Thank you, Gandhi. Yes. So I just wanted to basically echo uh, the bulk of what uh, Razia has said, and also just add to the fact and emphasis that, um, because the question is basically, is, is there a need to review, to review your IPS? And in response to that, my immediate answer would be, the IPS is a, is a living document. So even with or without coronavirus, you know, uh, some IPSs would have been due for, for review anywhere, and some would have been due for complete overhauls. 
Because bear in mind, we entered the, the virus when there were a number of factors that, that were already at play that in some instances would have warranted already on their own a review or a complete overhaul of the IPS. Some of them include there was already a rise towards passives, for instance. There was already a rise towards um, incorporation of uh, smart beta strategies. There was already a rise towards alternatives, for instance. There was already a rise towards taking into account things like uh, augmented intelligence, uh, emphasis on ESG investment principles, you know, all of those. And for most IPSs, you'd find that they were not like completely already on their own uh, incorporating all those factors. So I, I see coronavirus as an opportunity that has triggered uh, the need to actually review IPSs, not as, as the reason why IPSs should be, should be, should be reviewed. Thank you, Gandhi. Anybody else want to make a, a contribution? Yep, uh, thanks, um, uh, uh, Wei. I think uh, the discussion itself, you know, covered a number of uh, important aspects uh, that were raised by Razia. You know, uh, ranging from the issue of making sure that uh, there is some regulatory changes, of course, you know, um, to 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 to. to um, improve or to, to have a look in terms of uh, reviewing the investment strategy itself, um, those changes will be necessary. You know, trustees will have to go back and review their, you know, IPS. Uh, the other issue that uh, Raisa raised, I think, which is critical, is the issue of having pension funds themselves co collaborating. I think that one is a very important issue. Um, most of these funds tend to, you know, uh, function as standalone. But I think it is good for them as well to exchange, you know, information to exchange uh, their own investment strategies. Uh, I think that point was a very important one. The other issue that raise, uh, she raised, I'm um, sorry, Razia raised, was the model that you have to look at the model that uh, sort of optimizes return and impact. Linked to that, I think you've also raised another very important, uh, you know, point, Razia, in terms of the funds, you know, considering ESG, and more especially the 17 principles of responsible investment. I think that's a very, very critical point that you raised there. Thank you. Um, Chair, may I also add, this is Tolisa here. Yes, please. Um, um, I also wanted to touch on that um, in terms of uh, what uh, Razia um, mentioned around the, the rethinking around the objectives uh, of the fund to, to, to also consider the idea of optimizing risk returns and impact and perhaps even in, uh, incorporating um, the 17 sustainable development goals, which is what she touched on. Mm -hmm. And I think that um sparks a conversation perhaps for also another uh, webinar on its own in terms of funds or investors themselves kind of rethinking um the objectives of the pension fund because i think it has implications on you know does it implicate does the fund actually need to think about the development of the economy or think about just um, the members and you know the investment uh, the investments as far as they affect the fund only and I think um, that is something that um, resounded in, in me when I was listening to Razia and I think it's a question that does um, require I think some debate at some point to say do we do we need to really stick to um, a very narrow understanding of what the investment objectives of the fund, which would obviously be part of the investment policy, um, how narrow do we view those in relation to the greater South African uh, market? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I think there's just one comment which, or one question raised. Um, picking up, if we, if we don't get to your question now, apologies, we'll, we'll get back to it. I think the the question the question raised by William 
I know it's addressed to Gandhi, but it's probably something that everyone can address. I mean, that, that, that's part of the reason of the thinking behind this presentation or this, this webinar is there, there shouldn't be a knee jerk reaction. I think what, what William is asking here is Gandhi, won't COVID rush the process of reviewing IPSs? Um, and and if, if my observation is that we're saying, well, that the participants, the panelists are saying, it, it's, it's something that needs to be considered carefully and it can't be a knee jerk reaction. Uh, uh, abs absolutely, it shouldn't be. In fact, um, funds should take their time. They should just allow between now and the time when markets have fully recovered and we all kind of are certain in terms of the direction in which the economies and the market would be going. Only at that point should they actually implement uh, changes to their IPSs. But what they should be doing in the meantime between now and then is actually to start thinking around how their new investment strategy should look like going beyond once we are out of, out of the crisis. So it's not something that trustees should be doing now. In fact, this is actually the most strong time to be like implementing it because you'll be just then crystallizing all the losses that, that the market has suffered uh, uh, to this date. So nothing wrong with thinking about it and looking into it, but implementation should wait until, until we are out of the, out of the woods. Yeah, I think that's I think that's right, uh, Gandhi. I mean, uh, certainly trustees must start thinking about these things. You know, just looking at where we are right now. I mean, these are exactly the types of things that they that we are actually seeing a lot of that. COVID nineteen has brought a lot of the um, disparities or you know the differences in our country to the fore. And I think now is the perfect time for everybody to really start thinking about how we can actually improve this. How can we make it better? And um, having that power of the actual, you know, being able to deploy those assets in ways that can make those improvements is imperative, you know. And I think I think certainly that that must be that must be on the agenda. Any other? Um, I just have a, a quick comment because I, um, uh, this is Tolisa again. Just yes. the the idea of thinking about it, and I think. <laughs> um, uh, sometimes I, I think that is not enough <laughs> in, in, in this situation, just thinking about it. Because when you actually see how, for example, ESG has been approached, there's been a lot of thinking about it. But, you know, yes, you, you, you may not, there's no need to be, um, maybe, maybe this may not be the right time to implement stuff, but I think you need to go uh, as fans or as investors beyond thinking and trying to and actually operationalizing this thinking in your setting of policies yeah. because if you i mean looking going back to the question of the of, of this entire webinar it's around do we yeah. need to be you know relooking our policies so i beg to differ that we need to think about it we actually need to be doing stuff around the policy which will then be yeah, sorry sorry and, Holly, that and, was i i think <laughs> i used that very really loosely <laughs> and yes, I understand, Thank and I, it's not an attack, but I think it's something that has been also, uh, 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 and how can I say, something that has been inhibiting pro, uh, progress in things like transformation of the industry or um, you know implement, implementation yeah. of responsible investment, where there's this almost uh, you know whether you use loosely or very you know strongly that we need to think about it. No, we need to be doing more and. I'm quite um, happy for what we are doing with the UCT Retirement Fund, um, where, yes, we are not implementing anything, but we are taking steps that are beyond thinking to basically say, yes, our IPS review is coming up at the, um, later in the year, and how do we then plan around, okay, we need to have a workshop around transformation, a, a workshop around ESG, and then feed into the ultimate IPS review process from there, then we can then start implementing. So Lisa, can I ask you to, 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 to hold that for your section? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the point was around the thinking, uh, Chair, but yeah, cool. point made. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, we're getting there, and it is important. That, that, that's why we, we've carved out some, some time for, for that. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, if, if there's nothing else, I'd like to move on just for the, just so that we can manage our time. Um, everyone happy that we move on? Any other burning things that we need to say? I know this is a very emotive, important conversation. Better move on, if, if that's all right. Yes, sure. Thank you. Gandhi, can you, can you, I, I'm not going to try and pronounce your surname and please forgive me. Um, no, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I also struggle with it myself at times. <laughs> um, but everyone can see Gandhi's credentials there. And, and one of the reasons Gandhi has been invited is to, to, to help us understand what it is to, to look for in an investment advisor. And I think from the conversation we've had so far, it highlights the importance of having someone to, to guide you, to stop the knee-jerk reactions and maybe help you think about things that you wouldn't think of on your, on your own. Um, Gandhi, and, and one of the things I wanted us to, to look at, the, we've got the points there, and if I can maybe ask you to just talk to those three points for us, um, and, and then we'll invite some questions afterwards. Thank you, Gandhi. That, 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 thank, thank you, Wayne. Um, so, so the first question is with regards to the Association of Professional Fund Investors. Uh, I'm just going to share with you a brief overview of what this, the association is all about. So this is an association that was started way back in 2011. It is a global association. Ms. Chair, I also just need to quickly mention that it's really raining uh, cats and dogs down here in Cape Town. So if there is uh, a lot of unnecessary background noise, please just bear with me. It's because of the rains. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. But in, in, back to the, to the association, it's, it's a global association. It has got its headquarters in the, in the UK. Uh, it's still growing worldwide and it's starting to make inroads into, into South Africa. And why was it established? It was established as a realization that when you look at the financial service industry, most of the professionals that participate in this industry belong to a professional body, one professional body or another. For instance, if you take accountants and auditors, they belong to, in the case of South Africa, it will be SICA. If you take actuaries, for instance, uh, they belong to, in the case of South Africa, again, it will be ASA. Uh, if you take um, the legal guys from the legal fraternity uh, within the patient fund industry, for instance, they would belong to the patient fund uh, lawyers association. But when you look at those that the group of people that are responsible for allocating capital, the group of people, professionals that are responsible for giving investment advice, there just wasn't a professional body with which they could be identified. So that actually gave birth to the establishment of the Association of Professional Fund Investors. And it is basically a coming together of your investment consultants, investment advisors, anyone who is in the manager research space, anyone who is in the asset allocation space, anyone who is with fund of funds, uh, mortgage managers, all those people who invests assets on behalf of their clients would be eligible to join as a member. And currently it will be a member at an individual level. There is also talk at the, the leadership level to also start to allow companies to actually join as, as, as at a corporate level, at a firm level as well. So, and just in terms of what the mission of the, the association is, it is to advance the interest of investors by, promotion, by promoting professional standards and in integrity in fund investing. That's, that's basically the mission, the mission of the, the association. And there are about five key areas uh, through which the association aims to deliver on that mission. One is setting global standards of professionalism and accreditation for fund investors. The second one is sharing best practices in fund investing worldwide. So you have got members sitting in India, you've got members that are joining from the US, you've got members joining from Middle East, Asia, you name it. And the idea is really to just share 
best practices from all the different geographies and jurisdictions. Third one is facilitating professional fund investors to learn, share ideas, and network with their global peers. So one of the key deliverables of the, the association is basically to make sure that members do attend global events uh, where they, they discuss and debate different views in terms of where they see the industry heading towards and also affecting the direction that in which the, the industry should be should be adding. Fourthly is collaborating with media and event partners, basically you know, in, in a view to actually send the message and viewpoints of those that are responsible for investing funds on behalf of their clients. And fifthly, acting as the collective voice of the profession to national and global standard bodies and regulatory authorities. Basically this refers to engaging with governments and policymakers in terms of really shaping uh, the policy framework that then governs the industry. Like in the UK, for instance, where the association has been very active uh, on almost like twice a year over the past three years, it has been producing papers that the regulatory authorities in the UK have actually ended up making reference to in coming up with policy changes. So that's basically about the association, Ms. Chair. Uh, membership is open to anyone who is in the asset allocation manager research space and for more details regarding the association one can go to the website of the association it is profundinvestors.org I'll, I'll stop there with regards to to the association and let me on then jump on to to the next point unless unless there are questions with regards to the association, Mr. Chair, that I need to, to attend to. Thank you. In the up. Okay. Sorry, Gandhi, please proceed. Thank you. So the point two is on based on your experience, what is that trustee should be looking for when evaluating their current provider or on appointing a new provider? And if it's fine, Mr. Chair, I'm just going to combine that in my entire response together with point three. Also, maybe in the interest of time, uh, just to make sure that you know we, we we try and cover as much ground as possible. And so, point three is on in light of what you've discussed so far, what should trustees expect from their advisors during the COVID-19 pandemic and other shocks that 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 will lie ahead. So, I I, I guess the starting point with this one is by going back to, to principles as a point of departure. So when one looks at what's at core of retirement investing, it is basically nothing other than a process of putting aside between 10 to 15% of your salary over say an average of a 35 year period in the hope of then living another 35 years once you're in retirement. That, that's basically what it is. But one needs to make the emphasis that we're talking about putting aside between 10 and 15%. Well, in some instances, it's even much lower than that. I've seen numbers as low as 7.5%, but also there are fewer instances where it's higher than 20%. But otherwise, the bulk of the contributions would range between around 10 to 15%. So you are putting aside that, or members are putting aside that for a period of 35 years on average, and they intend to live off that once they're in retirement. And when you look at the lifespans that we're currently enjoying nowadays, it's, it would be for another 35 years, for instance, on average. So that's really not an easy toy. You're not putting aside 100%, you're only putting aside about a tenth of your, of your salary and you're expecting, because if your standards of living are going to be maintained, then it means when you get to retirement, then you should be able to draw something between 80% to 100% of your, of your salary. And that you need to achieve by putting aside only about 10 to 15%. So that's really, I just thought it was important that I make that emphasis just to, to bring to the fore what a tour and a challenge it is. And at the end of the day, there are basically going to be four different factors 
that will determine whether or not you are successful in doing so. The one is obviously the level of contributions that I've been talking about, which is on average about 10 to 15%. Uh, there are also instances where other funds provide for additional voluntary contributions, but we know that to a very large extent, that's not very common. So the one element of the four elements that I'm going to touch on is fixed your level of contributions, which are basically fixed. The second one is the fees that are deducted in terms of management fees. So it is really an important factor to also look at when you are looking at your entire IPS and investment strategy in terms of how much fees are we, are we paying to, to managers. I just need to bring to the fore that for every 0.5% additional fee that you pay in asset-based fees, there is a likelihood of a drop of about 20% in fund credit. So where a member was supposed to retire in with about a million rands, for instance, and uh, instead of being charged 0.5%, they got charged 1%. It actually drops that level of fund credits from a million rands to about to about 800,000 rands, which is quite which is quite a huge drop. The third element and contributing factor to how much you ultimately retire with is uh, the period over which you contribute. And I alluded already to the fact that it's an average of about 35 years. The reason why I'm mentioning this is basically to bring the emphasis on the importance then of the fourth element, which is the returns that you earn on those contributions. So the other three are kind of fixed in a way already. That then leaves only your the investment returns that you are going to earn to, to, to do all the heavy lifting that's required to actually get you to a point where, where you can retire comfortably. I, I just wanted to set that uh, as just coming back to the principles first, but because I wanted also to just set this, the record straight, that uh, where the emphasis is so much on the investment returns, then there is a lot of responsibility then that the trustees and indirectly the investment advisor so appointed carries in ensuring that the members' contributions that they make on a monthly basis actually grow over time up to the point where they can actually re retire on them comfortably. The one thing that's clear when it comes to investment management is that picking asset managers is hard which is basically what investment advisors do. But also what's even more difficult is picking other people to pick asset managers for you. So here now we're starting and coaching the space that relates between, that is the relationship between the trustees on one end and the investment advisor that they pick. So you picking an investment advisor to help you pick asset managers who then go on to pick companies because returns are not generated by asset managers. Returns are generated at company level. So asset managers are there to pick the vision and the, 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 uh, the uh, companies that they think are actually going to generate returns. You have got in the background behind them is an investment advisor who is picking the relevant uh, asset manager who is then going to be managing the money on, on, behalf of the, on behalf of the fund. So it, it is more complex than it appears when you just think of an investment advisor, you may just think, okay, it's just gonna be somebody who, who has got some exposure to investment markets and then I can hire them to give us advice. The emphasis I'm trying to make here is that it's a lot more important than, than just picking a, a, anyone who has got uh, knowledge about investment uh, markets. Um, but not only that, it's even more difficult to, 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 to do that. So that when trustees next are thinking of picking an investment advisor, I just want them to realize that it is really uh, an onerous process. It, it requires deep thinking, it requires a lot of guidance, it requires a lot of, a lot of, a lot of structure. That then takes me to the next point that uh, I want to, to just attend to in terms of now coming back to the specific question about trustees and the need for quality advice in capturing and evaluating investment, investment uh, strategies. So 
there is a point that needs to be emphasized on that investment advisors provide advice and not prescriptions to, to the board. And it is important that at every turn, the trustees are reminded of that fact or remind themselves of that fact that what comes from the investment advisor is just advice. The end result rests with the, the end, the final decision actually rests, rests, rests with the board. So it is uh, paramount that the, co the contributions of the, the investment advisors are, are basically seen uh, in, that, in, that, in that way. That then requires that when trustees are looking into appointing an investment advisor, that they need to have a process of their own that ranges from tendering, a tendering process for investment advisory services. They need to have a framework that looks into the selection process that they are going to follow because there's going to be a number of investment advisory firms that will respond to once it has gone out. There's going to be a need for trustees to have a framework at a fund level for ongoing monitoring of the quality of service that they are receiving from the investment advisor. So we are already now on framework number three. The first one is on tendering. The second one is on the selection process. The third one is on ongoing monitoring. The fourth one will be on once every couple of years, there is actually a need to evaluate the value that they will have received from, from, the, from the investment advisor. And further down, I'm just going to touch on how, how that value should look like. Then the, the fifth one will be, trustees also need to have a, a framework for the termination process. Because there will come a point in time when they realize that uh, for whatever reason, either circumstances have changed or they're not getting the kind of advice that they need, that it is time now to terminate uh, the services of one such investment advisor. They need to have a process in place that looks into, into that. Just in terms of uh, how then does do the trustees make sure you know, all of this is, is happening? I think the, the emphasis is just basically on, on, on accountability. And uh, to be able to achieve that, there is a number of things that trustees at fund level are required to do. Also, they are required to do at individual board member level. And in the next couple of minutes, I'm just going to spend some time you know, highlighting some of these things that trustees should make sure that they are in place for them to be able to to, to receive, to ask for and receive and be able to monitor the kind of service that they will be receiving from, from an investment advisor. The one is trustees themselves, because what's coming through is advice. And for you to be able to make sense of the quality of the advice, you should be able to engage with the advice that you are receiving. You should be able to make sense of the advice. And for a board of trustees to be able to do that, it means they should be able to converse with investment related matters themselves. So there is really a big need for trustees to actually see to it that they educate themselves on investment related matters. That would be number one. But I also kind of would want to excuse trustees on this because uh, bearing in mind that in the bulk of instances, most of the trustees would be, they've got their own professional backgrounds. They are not, they are not uh, uh, investment professionals by training. So, but now when one looks at the depth of engagement and, and conversation that takes place in board meetings with investment consultants, one realizes that the, the amount of knowledge that trustees have, even where they've received some bit of training, still stands out not to be good enough to actually interrogate uh, the advice that will be coming through from an investment advisor. So for that reason, I'd recommend that trustees should actually look into uh, bring on board professional investment uh, trustees uh, as just as a board member. So here we're talking about an investment professional whose day to day day to day their job is basically looking on on investment related issues. Not somebody who is who is retired because the rate at which markets are developing, as well as even strategies are being developed, requires that whoever is sitting on the same side of the board and is engaging with an investment advisor regarding 
investment related matters. One such person needs to be very much up to date with, with what's happening, not only in South Africa, but what's happening, what's happening globally. Also further to that, trustees would want one such professional to be among them because then that facilitates continuation of conversations on investment related matters even long after the investment advisor has left the room. It also facilitates ongoing conversations in between meetings, for instance, because the, the, the professional would be part of the board. And so any conversation, it will be an insider to the board. So any conversation regarding the fund and its investments, you'll be a part of and you'll be able to guide you guide the, the trustees accordingly, as opposed to only waiting once a quarter when the, when the body engages with an investment advisor. There's also a host of a whole lot of other things that trustees could look into. Uh, in other jurisdictions, for instance, and in other ge geographies, they've got uh, an outsourced chief investment officer role, where you've got your investment consultant on one end, but you still have got a chief investment officer who sits on the same side as the board and interrogates the advice that will be coming through from, from an investment uh, advisor. Just continuing with you know, a number of uh, things that trustees need to have in place to make sure that they are able to make sense and analyze and interrogate the advice that they'll be receiving from an investment advisor. It includes, um, in some instances, trustees could consider using independent third party evaluators on the appointment of investment advisors. Because I've seen in, the, in quite a good number of instances, um, investment advisors, a tender goes out, investment advisors come and they pitch. And the trustees then pick one out of a number that you have, would have pitched without themselves really getting advice on which one of the investment consultants they should be, or investment advisors they should be picking on. So there could be a need for trustees just to appoint a once-off uh, investment expert to come and sit with them at the point at which they are, they are, they are, they are picking an investment advisor. So that that one once-off appointee can actually then, on behalf of the trustees, ask all the questions to the different investment advisors that would be pitching. Uh, I'm, I'm quite mindful of the time, so I'm going to just... yeah, I'm sorry. It's been so interesting and worthwhile, so I haven't stopped you. So we need to give Gleisa some a few minutes as well, and we, we sort of run out of time now. So what I want to suggest is if you can maybe bullet point what you have to say, and if, if you're happy, we can share it in a, in a written form somewhere, if, if, you, if you wouldn't mind sharing that with us. Uh, not at all. So let me just bullet points. One minute, I think I'll be done. Thank you, Andy. Yeah, okay. Investment advisors should be subjected to a higher degree of scrutiny. I also mentioned that uh, investment advisors need to provide the same high level of disclosure as that required of asset managers on their performance. Um, that also funds need to multi-source advisory services and they have clear separation of roles. I think it's quite important that um, there is clarity on who is responsible for IPS development and who does manager selection, for instance, that trustees should seek second or third opinion on the advice, occasionally, of course, on the advice that they'll be getting from investment advisors. I also mentioned um, that trustees should prefer, should have a preference for independent consultants uh, and not those that are tied to an asset manager. Uh, evaluation of consultants should permeate through brand influences and focus more on individual skill and competencies. Trustees so should consider rotating investment consultants appointment. This is just my view, uh, as what is happening now in the auditing space, for instance, and that only dedicated specialist providers who take full accountability should be allowed to search, select, and blend managers. I'll, I'll stop there and I'll share the rest of the slides with, with you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Gandhi. I, unfortunately, we, 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 we've eaten into a lot of um, Kulisa's time and we're going to have to skip. I apologize for not managing the, the time as, as tightly as we should have, but it was, I think, a, a worthwhile engagement. Before we move on quickly, are there any comments from our, from our, our, our panelists and, and the IRF president? Um, Thank you, Wayne. Chair, There's nothing I... from my side, but I'm quite uh, happy 
with the issues that Gandhi raised, you know, around the identification of asset uh, consultants and asset managers, and also the critical role that the trustees are supposed to play. I think it's very, very interesting the discussion that uh, Gandhi, you know, brought forward around these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Kalisa, you were... Um, yes. Uh, just to clarify, Che, um, am I, can I leave my comments for my part or was my part also skipped? I'm, I'm trying no, to... No, your part's not understand. skipped. We're going to give you like five okay. minutes to sell and we'll have to do oh. something special for you for, 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 for a long oh, time. Oh, okay. Okay, let me wait for my part then. Then I'll, I'll, I'll incorporate my comments in my discussion. Razia, do you have anything to, to add? Yeah, no, I think... I mean, you know, it, it is important that uh, trustees um, understand what it is that they're getting from the um, from the advisors. At the end of the day, they uh, remain the fiduciary of the fund. So the ultimate decision and responsibility remains with the board of trustees, uh, depending on how they appoint the, the advisors. Um, I think it is also important for pension fund boards to understand that they can engage with the advisor as they want, you know, depending on what they need out of them, that's how they should engage and they should be clear about that uh, up front. Um, thanks. Thank you. Moving swiftly along, apologies for, for rushing this. Um, Khalisa, we're going to have to do a special session for you, but if you can add your, 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 your contribution for today's conversation and maybe we can organize something more for, for the work we've been doing on the, the guidance note. Thank you. Okay, th thanks, Chair. Um, well, in terms of the, the, the guidance note, to, to answer point one, um, when you look at it, there are three main expectations from this guidance note around uh, sustainability of investment. It's really expectations regarding aspects of this sustainability being incorporated in investment policies of um, uh, your pension funds. And over and above incorporating considerations into your policy, you, you are expected to disclose these and report on these. So those are the three things or three main things that are, are, are really expected from that guidance note, if you had to really summarize this. And based on what the speakers have then, um, uh, the, my, previous, my fellow speakers have, have highlighted, I wanted to um, just touch on things that uh, I kind of picked up and I wanted to comment on in terms of my comments. Um, I think Gandhi made a very important uh, point that returns are generated at a company level. But because you know your board of trustees are not dealing with the company at the level, so it's very important for them to manage um, the, or to understand how to, uh, to, to create policies that will better allow them to have some kind of management and influence over you know the, the engagements with these um, with these companies where the the assets are uh, ultimately invested. Uh, but one thing that was, struck me was the 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 need or the call for your board of trustees to have investment knowledge or kind of you know try to be um, uh, as knowledgeable as possible. And um, while I think it's it's a fair statement. I think parts of it is also a bit unfair because um, when you then think about it, there are various subcommittees that exist within a pension fund. So the investment committee, there's the communications, there's, you know, section 37 C's committees. So essentially your board of trustees becomes, um, will need to have expertise across all these various functions of a pension fund. And I'm not sure how possible that is. And I have a slightly different take in terms of the, then what um, the role of the trustee really is. And I see it as managing this organization that they call a pension fund. And in that management, then they make, and part of that management process, it is around managing the strategy and the implementation of the strategy. So they need to make decisions on that. And, and then in terms of then going forward is then how do they then do that? What's important is to then, coming back to the investment policy is to also think of their role as managing even the investment consultants that are that are appointed by them and I would say that uh, for example with this specific regard to sustainability and what the requirements of this guidance notes are what would be um, 
beneficial to think about as uh, retirement funds is how do you then manage it? And just like your pension, your pension fund investment consultants would t- talk about the five P's that they 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 look at when they're looking at a fund managers. Um, I, I I came up with the five M's <laughs> that um, that pension trustees um, would need to consider to um, they could think about and and apply in terms of engaging with their, their, with their investment managers, with their investment consultants. And the five M's is firstly, what matters? And the matters is really what matters from an ESG perspective in terms of setting your investment objective. You know, are you looking at it as a, a risk mitigating thing? Because we've heard that there's a lot of risks. Um, and while on the other side, there are also opportunities and that's where the developmental opportunities are, are, are present. So it should be interesting to then as a board of trustees, think about what is what matters and ask the investment consultants to say, we are going to review an investment policy. What matters for me to be able to make a decision around what goes into the policy that we ultimately sign off as a board of trustees? And what's been interesting um, in what we've been doing at the ECTRF is that also thinking about roping in the key stakeholders within, uh, this, uh, with this, within this fund and namely your members or your beneficiaries of the fund. And we've been really thinking hard about how do you then incorporate their views around what matters around the S&G issues. And we, we've spent quite a lot of time developing a survey which we will roll out to our members to also get their views so that they are roped into the, the policy um, decision or review process. And then the second M is ask your investment consultants Yes, there's all these things that we think matter, but what is material? And material with respect to your investments and your returns. So while I may, you know, I have my own agendas and my whole viewpoints and worldviews around what is important and what isn't, ultimately what needs to be managed is what is material to the investments of the members themselves. And that is something that your investment consultants should be able to help you with in your investment uh, uh, policy review process. And then the next one is what should be managed and how should it be managed? And that really speaks to, yes, you have, you've identified, you know, what matters and what is material, then how do you manage it? How do you then, uh, they need to then give you ways to manage it. If, for example, I saw a question from someone where they were asking, how do you then incorporate ESG when you have a pooled portfolio instead of a segregated, man, a segregated portfolio? And there is possibilities while it's, more, it's a bit more limited when it comes to a pool portfolio, you still have an opportunity to influence as a board of trustees through your selection process. And again, that is something that is highly influenced by investment consultants. So you can be very deliberate in asking them to be, to be very clear about how, what should be managed and uh, what shouldn't be managed or is not too important. And the, the, the fourth M is what should be monitored. And because the guidance not, note, uh, uh, is expecting not only reporting and, uh, but, uh, 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 but disclosure as well, you need to at least monitor these things so that you're able to generate reports that you can disclose. So it would be very important to then have these, um, uh, to have the trustees asking these investment consultants to help them with uh, information that will help them get to a decision or around what strategy um, uh, how do we monitor that we're actually meeting these sustainability aspects of our investments? And the last one is what should be measured? And I think this really speaks to um, the, the point of view that there is a, a there are now three dimensions with which you can look at your investment objectives, which is to optimize risk returns and impact. And a, a cornerstone of impact is measurement. Um, so it will be um, important for then the trustees to then look to, uh, and ask your, your, your investment consultants, um, this is what I need. I need you to let me know what should be measured. Given that we've discussed what you, we have an idea of what matters, what's material, what should be managed, what should be monitored, what should be measured. Um, and I think that should be something that could then inform things like your, your workshops um, before you you review your policy, and if you don't, you know, God forbid that you don't, don't have an investment policy, then it will inform how you formulate your first investment policy as a pension fund. Um, 
uh, given the, the short time, I think I'll end it there. But those are the main things that I wanted to put across in terms of um, the two points that I was given. Thank you. This has become a, a bit of a rush. It was obviously a, a bigger topic than the time we, we budgeted for. Um, what I do think we, we can do is, I know there's some specific questions that have been asked. Um, I would like to suggest that all the participants who are still here, if you have any further questions, please email them or raise them now, and we'll, we'll, we'll get back to you in a, in a separate sort of Q&A or, or, or some document um, just highlighting some of the discussion we've had today. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And I mean, we, we, we're nearly 15 minutes over time. So I, I, I would like to, to just invite the, the RF president to close off. It is a bit of a blunt close, I apologize. Um, but we will, seeing that there's so much interest that's been raised, see how we can explore some of the issues that have been, been highlighted in, in further discussions. Um, Enos, if I can hand over to you, please, to, to, to close the proceedings for us. Thank you, Wayne. And, and uh, thanks to our esteemed panelists uh, for the insight and the deep understanding of the issues. Uh, I must also thank uh, the last speaker um, for having you know, identified some of the most issues around streamlining what should be monitored, streamlining what should be measured. Thank you very much for that. Um, Wayne, I would like to, 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 to sort of um, thank our participants, uh, those uh, that are still with us here. You've also mentioned the issue of participants sending us questions. Yes, we welcome those questions and your questions can be emailed to our email, which is reception at irf.org.za. Reception at irf.org.za. Currently, we are finalizing a best practice guide for, for, for adherence to, to, to guidance notice number one, 2019. So that uh, process is ongoing. And once it's finalized, I'm sure we will be able to have another session with all, all of you as our esteemed participants. Thank you very much for participating in this webinar. And I'm sure we'll be seeing very, very soon. Feedback on how we can improve our services is also welcome. So please, if you think that there's some improvement that we need in our service offering, feel free to make it a point that you write to us. Thank you very much. Thanks thank very much, Enos. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you thank for you. your time and thank you for all the questions and comments as well. Uh, thank thank you. you very much for the opportunity. Thanks. All right, cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.